Hello and welcome back to another special edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project. Pleasure to have you with us today on Friday, December 1st. Also a great pleasure to be joined virtually in the studio today by Professor Matt Dickinson, a uh, professor of political science at Middlebury College. He's been down here uh, giving him several talks at the Green Mountain Academy of Lifelong Learning, or GMAL. Uh, he's also been a guest here on our program a couple of times. The last time was over a year ago, back in October of 2022. Well, that seems like a long time ago. So we're really pleased to have back with us today Professor Dickinson to, uh, to discuss politics and uh, kind of the upcoming presidential election, which is not quite 11 months away, but uh, which seems like a long time, a long time in politics, I guess, as the saying goes. But uh, Professor Dickinson, I guess uh, next November is going to be here before we know it. Yeah, well, we're already seeing the early movement of candidates uh, next door in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley spending the week there after getting a strong endorsement. So, yeah, we're in full-fledged campaign mode. Oh, boy. Uh, seems like only yesterday it was 2020 and all of that. But uh, anyway, it's certainly shaping up, uh, as all presidential elections uh, seem to, to be a very interesting one. And uh, I guess just to get us started uh, on, the, on this, I frankly find myself feeling very puzzled as to why uh, President Biden uh, seems to be polling so low relative to his likely Republican opponent, uh, Donald Trump, the former president. Looks like we're going to see a rematch of the 2020 election if, if polls and, and primaries uh, so far, or primary polling so far, uh, are any indication. Uh, I mean, uh, one could make an argument that the economy is not bad, and yet it sounds like a lot of voters have a hard time agreeing with that. They're, they're kind of looking at inflation figures, uh, and there just seems to be the general sour mood among a lot of voters uh, that that uh, that uh, really dragging down the president's numbers a little bit in, in some of the polling matchups I've seen so far, particularly the recent one that was done by the New York Times and Siena College, uh, which showed a virtual deadlock, and indeed the former president, uh, Donald Trump, uh, leading by a narrow margin in five or six of the, the crucial swing states, so Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Arizona, uh, those. What, what do you make of that? Do you, do you think that that's uh, something that, with 11 months to go, is reversible or changeable, or is it just a case where between that and the president's age at 81, just sort of uh, creating a, an impression in the minds of a lot of voters that eh, they're not comfortable with them. Well, normally I would say a year out or 11 months out, we know the polls are not that predictive of what's going to happen next November because most of the rank and file voters simply aren't paying attention to the election. And when they are asked in a head to head matchup, they're basically reacting more in terms of a referendum on. Joe Biden, as opposed to, do I have to choose between Biden and Trump? So if you're a Democrat, you want to be cautious about these results, but it's not the end of the world yet. Having said that, you point to some um, factors that I think if I'm a Democrat, I'm, I have to worry about. As you point out, the polling suggests in key battleground states that this is a toss-up race um, and that's not an outlier. You mentioned the New York Times poll. We're finding this consistently now across several different polls. So for whatever reason, this race is a toss up. Now, the other confounding factor you mentioned is the economy. And it is true the economy is trending in the right direction. But even at 2.4 percent or 3 percent inflation rate, what that means is still prices are going up at the gas pumps. They're going up at groceries. Uh, and we forget with people, particularly on fixed incomes, they notice this stuff if they're just getting by. And so although it's trending in the right direction, the reality for a lot of consumers is they're still struggling out there. Uh, and that is coloring, I think, some of their perceptions. But here's an additional factor, Andrew, which we have found. Increasingly, um, the view of the economy is being colored by one's partisan framing as the parties have become more ideologically distinct, and as particularly among the activists, more polarized, we're beginning to view objective indicators like inflation through a very partisan lens. Um, and I think people's attitudes towards leading political figures 
is increasingly resistant to the reality out there of changes, for instance, in economic circumstances. I think there's a certain amount of built-in resistance to the fact that, yeah, the economy is getting better. If I'm a hardcore Republican, I don't want to admit that, or at least it's not going to affect my, my perspective here. So I think that's coloring some of this polling. Now, having said that, um, you know, if Joe Biden's approval rating, which right now is about 40 percent, persists and it hasn't budged really since the summer of 2021, he's not going to win re-election. Um, that's just not high enough historically for an incumbent president to win re-election. So, yes, 11 months is a long time in politics. There's room for him to improve, I suspect, as this election is increasingly framed, not as a referendum on Biden, but as a choice between Biden and a four-time indicted opponent, that Biden's numbers might begin to creep up. But we'll see. Yeah, I, I suppose it's not uh, completely baked in yet. But uh, as you suggest, you know, the voters' perceptions, uh, to, the, to the extent that voters are going to be driven by economic questions, uh, even even if the economy were to have a, a remarkable run in the spring of 2024, I, it seems like fo folks are still stuck in the whole notion of, well, three or four years ago, I was paying two dollars and something for gas and now I'm paying three and something or the price of milk is two dollars a gallon more than it used to be and and that memory seems to have stuck very firmly uh, even though this would hardly be the first time in a, in a presidential election cycle when the price of gas or the price of some groceries had risen a little bit uh, since the last election but I guess we'll we'll see but of course there are <clears throat> There are several other issues in play, too, and you mentioned one of them there, which I wanted to talk about, uh, whether or not uh, you see these four uh, court cases that uh, the former president uh, will be facing, and we're not sure yet, I guess, in terms of the court dates, if they're going to be, you know, kind of completed by next November, but uh, I guess the first one, as I understand it, I believe it's the one in Georgia, uh, or no, excuse me, the one in Washington, D.C., uh, about the documents uh, in, in Mar-a-Lago might be going to trial in March, I think a day before the Super Tuesday primaries, which is kind of a fascinating piece of timing. But do you think that that would be something that would kind of register with those sort of in-between independent voters who, uh, who might not be hardcore partisans for one, one party or the other? But is that something that, you know... Uh, People would still react to and go, you know, if, it, if, the, if the evidence that is produced it looks kind of, you know, uh, not good from the standpoint of the former president, uh, would that be enough to change some minds, do you think? I think so. Uh, it's not playing much of a role in the Republican nominating contest, um, mostly because the candidates are staying away from it. Um, a lot of them want to win over Trump supporters and you're not going to do that um, by harping on these indictments for the most part. But when you get to that general election and the swing voters, as you point out, are those independents and, and the Biden campaign, assuming he is the nominee, makes an issue of this, as I'm sure they will. I do think that is going to hurt Trump. Um, you'd rather not be an indicted candidate than be an indicted candidate. That's And it's going to remind individuals, this guy is a polarizing, divisive figure. Do we want to go through four more years of this? I think it will become a salient issue and one that I think will help Biden. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, just talking to folks around here, it just seems like everyone feels a little burned out and tired of uh, all the polarization and division. And uh, and uh, four more years of, of that certainly is probably more than a lot of people seem to want. But uh, it will be fascinating to see, because I don't think we've ever had a major party candidate who was indicted, who was also a presidential candidate at the same time. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but thinking back no. to history. Like uh, a lot of things with Trump, this is a first. <laughs> well, uh, of course, there are, there are several other issues kicking around on the federal level here that uh, uh, you know, whether the various candidates are, are reacting to. And when this kind of uh, grabbed my attention recently, I mean, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's the whole immigration issue. I mean, do you, do you think that that's going to be something 
that could be, you know, really a, a you know, after the economy and, and maybe after uh, the, the legal uh, maneuvering, something that could, you know, shift in an ele uh, the election results, and particularly in the, on, the, on the border states, like uh, I'm thinking Arizona and places down in the south and southwest, uh, where voters are really kind of tuned into that whole question. I think it is one of several issues. It may not be as prominent as pocketbook issues, but the fact is the border is a mess. It is an issue that has come up repeatedly among the Republicans, if you've been paying attention to the debate. No doubt the Republican nominee, and let's assume it's Trump, um, who has made this an issue before, will make it an issue again. Um, and I do think it has regional impact in a way that you know some areas of the country are going to prioritize this border wall or border security more than other places. Where I think it's really interesting is um, there's been an erosion of support for the Democratic Party and candidates among Latinos. And you might think this immigration issue is one that will play to Democratic strengths. They're more for legalized immigration um, and more humanitarian, but it's not. A lot of um, Latino voters are actually for stronger border control. Uh, and we saw this in the 2022 midterms um, and in the 2020 election. So yeah, I do think it's going to play a role. This assumes, of course, that there is no progress on comprehensive immigration reform between now and the election. And why would there be, frankly, given this Congress? Highly unlikely, uh, particularly given our uh, uh, <laughs> or shall we say divided Congress, uh, which is the point I'd love to get to in a, in a few minutes. But uh, yeah, I, w I wanted to explore that whole question of why Biden is so weak among uh, uh, the Latin voters and also among African-American voters, too, it seems like. And and as well, I guess we could bring in the, the question uh, of the divisions that seem to be emerging between the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the, what we'll just call the mainstream wing. Uh, there seem to be a lot of divisions uh, emerging among the traditional coalition of Democrats that really are going to be, I think, a hard problem to, for them to solve if, if these issues kind of, kind of can continue on the way they're going. I think that's absolutely right. It's one of the understated trends in American politics that really predates the Trump administration, but continued during Trump's presidency and into Biden. And that's the movement among lower educated Latinos and Blacks away from the Democratic Party. And a recent book that came out by Rui Teixeira uh, and John Judas, Where Have All the Democratic Voters Gone?, zeroes in on this ongoing realignment. And uh, they make the argument, uh, and I think it's a, a fairly persuasive one, that the Democratic Party has sort of lost sight of the bread and butter um, underlying basis of that New Deal coalition, which was um, higher wages, let's focus on uh, health insurance, the reducing the cost of living for workers. Um, and they've moved to emphasize, at least among the most visible part of the party, uh, cultural social identity issues. Um, and they don't diminish the importance of those, but they they're not as important to a lot of these uh, Latino and African-American voters who are much more interested in things like education, healthcare, and in wages. Um, now, I wouldn't go too far here. The, the African-American vote is still, according to polls, 75% um, or higher supporting Biden. So it's not like we've had a dramatic reversal, but the problem is in a closely contested election, in a state like Georgia, uh, if they don't turn out for Biden, that can be fatal for his candidacy. And so I think it's a real concern going forward. And it's a concern, I think, that's not getting a lot of recognition. Uh, you know, there's a tendency to dismiss Trump supporters as uh, racial bigots motivated by white ethno nationalism. But that's really a small component of what drove his support. The fact is, um, he's actually uh, gained you know, over his four years in office support among Latinos and African-Americans, as you point out. 
so he continued a trend that preceded him. Uh, and I think it's a potential problem for Democrats. Let me just uh, shift over to the foreign policy side of things. I mean, typically foreign policy kind of plays a, I don't know, a secondary role in presidential elections unless there's a, a hot war going on, like we saw in the Vietnam era or uh, during the Iraq war. Um, but we certainly have uh, a situation right now where, well, if the world is not on fire, then it's getting close to it with, between the war in the Middle East, between the Israelis and, and uh, the Gazans, uh, Hamas, and uh, the war in Ukraine. We have issues with China and Taiwan. Um, do, you, do you think uh, the foreign policy side of things is going to be a factor for our, a lot of voters? Well, I think it's less of a factor than domestic concerns, but it becomes increasingly important to the extent that it has domestic implications. Um, you know, in 2016, both Bernie Sanders on the left and Donald Trump on the right, uh, I thought, scored points by um, both pushing against these multilateral trade deals, which is part of foreign policy, but also saying we've got to get out of this um, effort to remake the world in America's image with these neoconservative uh, democratic movements. And that resonated a lot with a strand, particularly among the Republicans, of, uh, I, I wouldn't say isolationism, but America first attitude. I think that's still a potent argument. And you see that in particular in debate among Republicans about Ukraine in aid. Um, there's a real schism there among the activists. I don't think that is as pertinent down among the rank and file voters. But if candidates make it a salient issue and it begins to have implications um, domestically uh, in terms of uh, foreign aid um, and things like that, yeah, it could play a, a, a more salient issue than it normally has been in recent elections. One of the things I've been struck by recently is is the split uh, between you know the progressive Democrats and and those mainstream Democrats over uh, over the the Gaza situation, um, you know, and I it seems like uh, a number of progressives have uh, been you know really strongly urging a, a, a permanent ceasefire there to uh, I guess give time for some kind of uh, peace talks or whatever, but. Uh, uh, I, I, I guess the question in my mind is, is this going to, since, since President Biden so far has, has been strongly, you know, vocally supporting the, the Israelis, although I'm sure behind the scenes a lot of conversations going on, a lot of shuttle diplomacy happening, and a lot of pressure being brought to bear that they can't really talk about publicly yet. Um, but I wonder if, if this uh, situation is going to uh, linger on in the minds of uh, progressive Democrats who typically would have been, when faced with a choice between Trump and Biden, would have said, well, you know, I, not a choice for me. I got to vote for Biden. If that would diminish his support. And again, uh, particularly in those uh, half dozen or so swing states where, as we saw in 2020, 10,000 or 15,000 votes made the difference between who carried the state and got those electoral votes. Yeah, I think the worry, if you're Joe Biden, and I, I think he has taken a little bit of a hit on this, although I wouldn't overstate the impact of the Hamas-Israeli war on his approval ratings yet. But if it lingers, if the region uh, increasingly destabilizes uh, and you see the war spreading to, um, you know, Hezbollah begins more overt military action and the U.S. has to make a conscious choice it could play a role here because, as you point out, the progressives are, are I wouldn't say pro -Ham Hamas, but certainly pro Palestinian uh, Palestine rights here. And in a close election, that could play a role. You know, one place where we do see that perhaps having an impact on Biden supporters among young voters. Um, and I don't think they're going to vote for Donald Trump necessarily, but they might not vote at all, or they may go third party. Right. Um, Marianne Williamson within the Democratic nomination, um, but also, you know, a Robert Kennedy Jr., um, a Cornell West, all of whom they may find more appealing on this issue. So it is a potential flashpoint here. 
Well, let me just shift over to the Republican side of the ledger here on this one. Uh, I mean, it seems like a foregone conclusion that uh, Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. He's polling 40 points or more, it seems like, uh, uh, ahead of Ron DeSantis and uh, Nikki Haley, who seem to be the two uh, closest competitors to him. And do you think there's any chance that, uh, you know, that that forecast could get upset and that uh, either Haley or DeSantis could actually emerge as uh, a competitive alternative, at least, let's say, by next March for the, the Super Tuesday primaries? Well, there's a chance. Um, as a betting man, I wouldn't put my children's tuition on either Haley or DeSantis winning this nomination. I think it's a long shot, but their strategy is clear. Um, come out of Iowa with a respectable second and then an upset in New Hampshire. Uh, Nikki Haley has been trending in the right direction in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is a quirky state, as you know, uh, and consolidate the non-Trump support and get that backing of the, you know, the Koch brothers network and others and head into Super Tuesday and make the case that Donald Trump cannot win in a head to head matchup. And we don't want four more years and see where the chips fall. That's the strategy. I think it's a long shot strategy. Uh but I wouldn't rule it out because, as you pointed out, we're in uncharted waters with the indictments, and at least one of them may go to trial during this nominating process. So uh, it's certainly a possibility here among the Republican Party. There's also that generational shift um, in both parties are struggling with the age of their their leading um, contenders here. And I do wonder whether a younger voice might just catch fire here, um, a Nikki Haley, uh, a Ron DeSantis among Republicans because of that generational gap as well. How, how critical do you think it would be for folks like, let's say, Chris Christie and some of the others, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, to drop out? They just say, well, you know, the numbers just aren't there. I, it's not my time. Because in 2016, it, it seems like... Uh, the verdict there was that uh, Ted Cruz and, and some of the others uh, hung in Don't to the point it, no. where, you know, they they, they, they they kind of divided the opposition to Trump you know, within the Republican primary uh, uh, votes. Um, do you think it would be important for, let's say, a Nikki Haley, who seems to have some momentum going on right now, that, let's say, someone like Chris Christie would just say, yeah, you know, I, I encourage my supporters to, to uh, support you know, Governor Chris, Governor Haley. I think it's crucial, Andrew. And I think the the more recent example is 2020. Joe Biden loses in New Hampshire. They're heading into South Carolina. And what happens between then and now? Uh, Beto uh, drops out. Um, um, Amy Klobuchar, uh, while they're in South Carolina, drops out and endorses. They coalesce behind Biden. And that pretty much clinches it for him. He wins South Carolina. If a similar thing happened here, uh, I think it would be to the benefit of whoever they coalesce behind. The problem is you have a, you know, for want of a better term here, um, you have an instance in which everyone says it's best for the Republican Party that we don't nominate Trump. But let's consolidate behind someone else. And they each say, yeah, it's me. And they it, they don't coordinate well. They didn't coordinate in 2016. Uh, I have no faith that they'll coordinate now, but hope springs eternal if you're in somebody who doesn't want to see Trump win. But you're absolutely right. That has to happen for uh, the never Trumper to have a, a chance of preventing him from getting nominated. It's just hard to do. Because it just seems like... Uh... Donald Trump has a has a lock hold on a sizable percentage of people who vote in Republican primaries. Maybe not all Republicans, but those folks who, who make it a point to get out and vote in the primaries. Uh, it just seems like uh, he's their guy and, and nothing seems to shake it. Yep. He's got a 40 percent guaranteed support going into almost any nominating contest. And the problem Republicans have faced in previous years is when a candidate drops out, not their support doesn't all go to the Trump alternative. Some of their support goes to Trump because he's the front runner. Um, and that's that's been Trump's philosophy in 2016, and it'll be his philosophy in 2024. I don't need to win over everybody. 
I just need to win over enough to stay in the lead and become the nominee. Um, as uh, the time progresses and the alternatives dwindle, uh, it's not necessarily the case that they're all going to consolidate against Trump if history is any guide. Which which brings up an interesting point that you alluded to a moment ago there about third party candidates. Uh, I mean, this is certainly strikes me as one election where uh, uh, a third party candidate could appeal to a lot of voters who are in that kind of vague middle ground, uh, who are concerned about the age of both candidates, who are tired of both of them, which certainly would seem to open the door to uh, a Robert Kennedy who's got instant name recognition, uh, maybe even a Jill Stein or uh, or, uh, or one of the others. Uh, I just, uh, it just seems like, or the, the no labels, Joe Manchin yeah. moomlet uh, mm -hmm. is another one that's uh, poking around in there. Well, Joe Manchin is really an intriguing wild card here um, because he's engaged in the proverbial listening tour. Uh, that's always a euphemism for I'm running. Um, but uh, I won't officially declare, but he's certainly sounding out all the the signs are he's sounding out support. Uh, if Biden falters, does he run or uh, within the Democratic nomination or does he go third party, the no labels candidate? The difficulty, of course, is getting on the ballot. It's one thing uh, for one of the two major party candidates to get on the ballot. Usually it's pretty easy, but some states make it very difficult for third party candidates to get on. You've got to uh, get enough signatures, often spread across different congressional districts within a state. It's not easy. It costs a lot of money to do that. I will say about Robert uh, Kennedy Jr., he is polling in three-way matchups between Biden, Trump, and Kennedy at 14, 15 percent. That is a very high number historically compared to third-party candidates at this stage of the race. Is he going to win? No. Well, anything can happen, but I don't think so. Can he play a spoiler role in those key battleground states like Ralph Nader did in Florida uh, or New Hampshire in 2000? Yeah, I think that's a very real possibility. Now, right now, our best evidence is he's drawing about equally from uh, Trump and Biden. Um, so there is that if you're Trump or Biden. Um, it's not clear he's hurting you more than he is your alternative, but he may be hurting both of you. That would really be fascinating. Uh, yeah, uh, Ross Perot in 92, another case uh, where it's very, a third party candidate had an impact. Um, well, in the few minutes we have left, uh, I just wanted to take a few moments to talk a little bit about politics closer to home here in Vermont. Uh, we've got an election coming up here too uh, in 2024 for uh, the governorship and also uh, a Senate seat. Bernie Sanders is going to be up for. Uh, re-election or not. Uh, any sense as to whether or not Bernie, who is also going to be in his 80s, well, already is in his 80s, is uh, going to continue on for at least one more term? Well, it's late in the cycle. If you want to um, make it easy for someone to replace you, in Bernie's case, I think as chair of the Senate um, Health Education Labor Committee, He's in his element to shape policy to a greater degree than ever on issues that he cares about. I think he likes his job. I think he's found his groove. He's influential. If his health hangs in there and knock on wood, I suspect he'll try one more term. If not, then you have the, the musical chairs here with perhaps Becca Ballant after two years moving up. Certainly, the lieutenant governor may see an opportunity here. Um, but if Bernie wants to clear the field, I think it's his, obviously. Um, Scott is an interesting case. He's a Monmouth poll, just, I think it was 85% approval rating, uh, the highest in the country, uh, of any governor. I mean, that's astounding, but that's incredible. Does, it, does, it, does it translate into getting anything done in the next two year period other than vetoing spending bills and perhaps getting overridden. That's what he's got to ask himself. Former Governor Jim Douglas said, it's always early, uh, better to leave too early than to too late. Uh, and so I think Scott faces a real choice here. But again, he's not leaving a lot of time 
for an alternative to step in there. And who would the alternative be? The Republican bench is very weak. Maybe Neil Lunderville, uh, the former Secretary of Administration under um, uh, Jim Douglas and now a businessman. He's worked for both Democrats and Republicans. But I don't know, Andrew, who the alternatives would be. And that may factor into Scott's decision making as well. Yeah, uh, one does struggle to think of like who would be the next in line uh, Republican for for that uh, that seat. But this would be, I think, uh, if I'm doing the math right, this would be Scott would be running for a fifth term. Right. When the only governor I think we've had in at least in recent years who made it through five terms was Howard Dean, I I think. Uh, uh, Douglas did four. I think Dean did five. Um, my memory fails me as uh, I get older. Um, but yeah, there is a, you know, there's two things that begin to kick in here. Uh, you know, you're, how long can you bang your head against the wall, even as a popular governor, if that's not translating into getting policy through, and maybe you're satisfied just holding the line on spending, but also where's your bench? You need to be showing coattails in this state. You need to work at building your party, um, your party brand. And in recent years, the other Republicans have been Trump-like, which Scott is demonstrably not. Um, you've got to do more to build up the party in this state. Um, and uh, I think that is maybe the most important legacy that Scott can leave here. Yeah, because it's it, an interesting question then would be like, well, who, who might be uh, one of the Democratic opponents of, let's say if it's Phil Scott running again, uh, I mean, uh, David Zuckerman, I guess, would be the obvious uh, candidate in waiting, uh, although he, he kind of... Uh, the former mayor of Burlington uh, has made noises, although the rest of the state, I think, historically, is not generally happy with having a Burlington calling the shots as, as governor. I, don't, I can't think of a mayor doing well in a run for the governor's race, but certainly Weinberger might be a candidate. Right, right. Although Burlington, Burlington's gotten a lot of... Not so great publicity in recent years between uh, drugs and crime and uh, and uh, everything else. So he'd face a few challenges there out there in the in the field, as well as being from Burlington. So that would sort of be not not a great calling card if you're in some of the more rural parts of the state, I imagine. But uh, interesting question. Well, oh well, I guess we'll uh, we'll learn more as time goes on. And there's certainly, I think it's going to be a very interesting. Uh, election year next year uh, uh, a lot of issues uh, I think uh, that will be bubbling up in Vermont uh, the school tax question being one uh, the governor yesterday came out with a, uh, a letter saying that uh, the prospect of a near 20 percent increase in education taxes was a non-starter uh, it certainly is a breathtaking number for a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. And if that were actually what a lot of voters are faced with, come March town meeting, I'm sure that that will uh, that will give pause for thought. I guess. I think that's the the type of issue that will keep Scott on the ballot uh, for two more years. Just you need somebody in the state house uh, who will um, control spending, uh, and he's promised to use that surplus that you see entirely to hold down the education. Uh, increase, which is almost certainly going to happen if the common level of appraisal is, it drops as the projections are. Um, you got to make up that loss of value somewhere. Well, uh, so all this means, of course, that at some point next summer, we'll have to pick up where we left off of this conversation and uh, I look forward to see, see what, our, see what our, our predictions and forecasts were, uh, how they play out. But anyway, well, Professor Dickinson, thank you again for uh, making the time to be with us today. I always, always enjoy these conversations, and uh, they're always a lot of fun and interesting. So anyway, but we'll leave it there for today. Uh, and uh, thanks to all of you who have been with us and hope you found the program interesting. Well, we'll see you again the next time. Meanwhile, have a great day today.